Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. This is one of those beautiful autumn school days. Doesn't this just feel like a school day? The sun is shining, the leaves look beautiful. Thank you for being here with us today. My name is Amy Fedigan. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction in Darien Public Schools. So happy to be here. Um, I just finished my first year last year, so beginning year number two. I spent my first 25 years in Milford Public Schools, and I've been very pleased um, to join a school system that is so committed to instructional excellence and supporting students and staff in our daily work. So thank you parents for being here today and having this interest in our continued growth as a school system. Um, I'm joined today by Julie Droller, who is our director for elementary curriculum. And we also have a number of principals and interventionists in the room that Julie will introduce all of us to. We're also joined by two members of the Board of Education. Sorry, I know I just saw that, that face. Sarah Barron and Robin Nelson, who are in the middle. It's also important to extend gratitude to the board for your support of our work. Um, it is certainly not easy. Um, to be a board member, um, and we appreciate everything you do and your commitment. It's also um, becoming more and more challenging, I would say, to teach children in schools and to lead schools. So thank you and gratitude to the staff. And as a parent myself, I know parenting is getting no easier as well. So what I would say is it's great that we're all in this together and um, our partnership is what strengthens the school system. What you'll hear about today, come on in Mr. Betts. What you'll hear about today is our literacy program in Darien Public Schools. It's important to know that this journey um, began quite some time ago with uh, Julie Droller and the team in Darien submitting a waiver to the state, providing lots of information about the very strong program that we have in Darien Public Schools and the wonderful results that that program has, um, has helped our school system achieve over the years. And the state did provide feedback to that waiver, as the state did to districts all across the state of Connecticut. And they provided feedback to us, which we've been very responsive to. Some of the things we knew about and were on our plan anyway. And um, we've been very thorough in our response. So there are many districts that are taking the state's feedback and kind of just holding course. There are other districts that are just adopting wholesale programs. We've been very thoughtful and intentional in our work in having a very large steering committee. This work at the state is really a K-3 literacy program, but we've taken the approach that we should be thinking about preschool through grade 12. Because after all, it's a continuum for literacy. It's a trajectory in which our children develop as readers and writers and thinkers. So we have um, a group of about 60 teachers that have been and leaders and interventionists engaging the work of looking at our literacy program, finding the areas that we're, we're thinking that we have great strength, and also looking at ways to improve our program. In public school education, we believe in continuous improvement and we believe in early intervention. So that's a part of our natural, the natural course of our work um, as teachers and leaders. And so what we've done is taken a look at the current programming that we have and the programs that are available on the state approved list. And one of the things um, that we've done as we've engaged in this professional learning is we've really reinforced our belief that it's not just a program, it's not a program that teaches children and helps us attain outcomes for their achievement and excellence in learning as readers, writers, and thinkers. It's the teacher in the classroom. So what you'll hear about today is not only the names of different resources that are used or resources that we're piloting, but also the instructional strategies that are used to develop very strong readers, writers, and thinkers in our classrooms. So at this point, I will turn it over to Julie Droller, and um, she'll introduce the rest of the team and Tell us all about literacy in Darien Public Schools. Thanks, Julie. Okay. I think you did a nice job of contextualizing that. You're welcome. I can go over a few things. So let me just introduce the members of our team that are here right now, and I know some of them are, will be joining us a little bit later. Chris Melillo, principal of Ox Ridge. Ross Cooper, principal of Hinley. <laughs> Leslie Davis, assistant principal of Hinley. Nicole Pentor, Literacy Specialist at Hinley. Amanda Elgert, another Literacy Specialist at Hinley. Natasha Torre, Principal of Royal. Ryan Betts, Principal of Tokenique. Just joining us now, Anne Marie Galgano, Assistant Principal at um, Holmes. 
So thank you all for taking the time out of your busy day. I also want to thank the Darien Library for giving us this beautiful space and um, setting us up with their technology. It's super, they're delightful to work with. So um, Dr. Fedigan talked pretty much about all of these things that we're gonna touch upon today. We'll talk about the science of reading and the legislation, what this means for us, and what our instruction actually looks like in our classroom, including the programs and resources, and next steps. So what is the science of reading? The science of reading is a research-based approach. It's based on an understanding of those foundational skills that all children need explicit instruction in to learn how to read. Um, it is based on research from cognitive psychology and neuroscience that shows that good readers attend to the letters in words and identify what words say. Word recognition is the foundation of reading and phonemic proficiency, and I'm gonna talk about phonemic awareness, but phonemic proficiency is critical. Students need systematic explicit phonics instruction to learn to read words, and reading comprehension occurs when both decoding and oral language and comprehension are strong. So it's that, um, that combination of those skills. So Connecticut's right to read legislation um, just to give you some background, this is a national um, focus because only 32% of America's fourth graders were reading at grade level according to um, a, a national assessment that was done, it's done every year, but this was data from a few years ago, which is alarming. So in June 2021, Connecticut passed right to read legislation, and just to summarize the key components of that, it was a coordinated state, where it is, a coordinated statewide plan for reading instruction. Um, it identified specific universal screening tools in grades K-3, universal administered to all students three times a year to, sto to um, identify students who are not at benchmark so that districts can intervene. Um, it also includes a menu of specific reading programs that are based on the science of reading that districts are um, instructed to choose from. And there was a process for districts submitting a waiver and 90 some odd districts in the state did that. And we received feedback on December 1st of last year indicating that we had parts of our program that were approved and parts that um, needed work. So what does this mean for Darien? Based on the, the waiver decision, we pulled together a literacy committee. As um, Dr. Fedigan said, we have over 60 educators. It's very comprehensive. We started that shortly after we received the feedback. And we started out by identifying as a district, what are our core beliefs about reading instruction? What is really important to us? And what would drive our review of the resources that we are um, investigating? Next, we had a smaller subset of that committee, um, really our K-3 educators, including teachers, administrators, our literacy specialists, who really understood the nuances of literacy instruction and our data, our students, te what teaching and learning looks like. And they developed a tool to review materials based on the, the tool that was used by the state to um, look at all of the waivers. So, so that team reviewed materials, they conducted site visits, um, they, they also, um, weighed different aspects of the program. They did some research um, as well, learned a little bit more. We've been studying the science of reading for a few years since you know we're very current on research, but even did a little bit more about why these programs were on the list. Um, and then the team determined that there was one program in particular that they wanted to pilot. So Into Reading was a core reading program that our team decided to pilot and we talked about what that would look like. 
We wanted to pilot in grades one through three. The reason that we didn't choose kindergarten to participate is because there's also legislation about play-based learning, which we're very excited about, and we wanted that to be the focus of our kindergarten teachers. So we included these three grades. We have teams from across five schools. We had some teachers who were on our committee, but because they're whole teams, we had some teachers who were not. So it was a mix, and it was determined really by the principals. Um, we just felt like um, we, we didn't want to be biased. We really wanted to be like everybody is a part of this work. So the next step for us is decision making, and we are looking at um, do we, we had three choices. We would keep our current program as is, keep our current program with enhancements, or choose this into reading program. And we all decided, as Dr. Fedigan said, we are a district of continuous improvement. We know that we always have work to do, um, and we always will, because we're always learning new things. So we decided that one of the choices would be our current program with enhancements, and another choice would be into reading. So that's where we are now. So what does literacy instruction look like in Darien? All students, regardless of the program or materials, receive direct instruction in phonemic awareness in grades K-2 and students who do not meet, meet benchmark beyond that. All students in K-3 receive explicit direct instruction in phonics. We use the Foundations program, um, which is scientifically research-based, based on an Orton-Gillingham multisensory approach. Um, all students receive direct instruction in spelling, vocabulary, reading comprehension and fluency, grammar, and writing. So balanced literacy versus structured literacy is um, one of the reasons behind this science of reading approach. Balanced literacy emphasizes reading instruction through various approaches including word study, high-frequency word instruction, a variety of texts, some that are teacher-curated, some that are student-selected, explicit writing instruction, um, and it emphasizes student-centered learning and critical thinking. One of the misconceptions about balanced literacy is that balanced literacy means guessing at words. That's not what balanced literacy is. It is that balanced approach. Structured literacy really emphasizes phonics instruction and practicing word patterns, using the knowledge of word patterns to decode text. It's based on the idea that children can't encode, which is spelling, or decode naturally, so these skills must be developed, which we agree with. Um, it also includes teacher and text-dependent questions for voc uh, vocabulary and comprehension instruction. So what is our approach and our resources? We, we do believe in a balanced literacy approach, um, and these are the various components of balanced literacy. There are methods of teaching, but at the heart of it all is, is reading workshop. All of the things in the science of reading, that explicit instruction and phonemic awareness and phonics, fluency, we believe in explicit instruction and we provide that explicit instruction. However, the reading workshop is an opportunity for students to apply those skills independently and have opportunities to practice in a variety of texts. Teacher curated texts, and I'll show you some examples, what we call decodable text or connected text where students are required to use their phonemic awareness and their phonics skills to read the words as well as level texts and, and chapter books because we believe that students need both. Um, we also, and I'll, I'll talk more about all of these components, some of them are whole group, some of them are small group, but it is a balance. And this is just the definition of, of some of those terms. Balanced literacy, I talked about that, it's that framework. Phonemic awareness is the ability to hear and manipulate sounds and spoken words. So for example, um, if, a if a child can identify um, the sounds they hear in cat, k at, or think about if you took the beginning sound off of 
cat and, and put an mm sound, it would be mat. So it's the ability to hear um, rhyming words and, and being able to um, break words into syllables. So that is phonemic awareness. Phonics is the understanding that letters represent sounds and being able to break apart those, those letters and read those words in text. Orthographic mapping is a process of connecting the sounds in words to the letters that make a word, and, and we'll talk about that more to solidify it and map it in the brain. Um, cueing is a strategy that prompts readers to use multiple sources of information to figure out words. So for example, um, it might be like, slide your finger through that word and read each sound. Um, it could be, go back and check it, does it make sense? So we do cue for meaning, but not as a way to decode the word. And that is a sh one of the shifts that we have made. Um, decodable text, as I said, requires students to use their phonic skills. So the majority of the words, not all of the words, but most of the words in that text, students need to use their skills to figure out the word and read the text. So how is our program aligned to the phonics of, re uh, uh, the, to the science of reading? As I explained before, we use, um, and, and I'm gonna get to this later, but we use Hegarty to explicitly teach phonemic awareness. We use foundations to teach phonics in grades K3. We provide explicit instruction in comprehension, fluency, and critical thinking text analysis through our reading workshop approach. Um, and that includes teachers thinking aloud, teachers reading aloud, and asking um, open-ended questions where students have opportunities to turn and talk and build their oral comprehension, their listening comprehension, their speaking skills, as well as their critical thinking and, and analysis. Um, they receive explicit instruction in oral language development and vocabulary and that academic discourse through read aloud, which is so important. We also, and this I would say is the heart of our instruction really, is data-driven small group instruction. So we use a variety of not only the universal screeners that I just mentioned in the beginning, um, which are mandated, but actually we had those in place for years before um, the state mandated that particular resource, so there was no shift there. But we use those as well as our own curriculum-based resources, and our goal is to identify um, deficits in student learning or challenges as soon as we as soon as we see that there's even the inkling of a problem and we intervene first at the classroom level and then we have um, interventionists who have a reading background and provide additional support. So we really believe in that small group um, intervention and instruction. And adherence to scientifically research-based intervention. Um, currently, currently, we're in the process of shifting from SRBI, which is scientifically research-based intervention, to an MTSS model. Um, which I'm not really gonna get into in this presentation, but it's a more comprehensive approach. And we're, as I, it's just one of those ways that we are always getting smarter and getting better at what we do. But what tiered intervention looks like, again, that foundation is high quality differentiated instruction for all students. And we really believe that no matter what, whether there's 20 children in a class or 25 children in a class, they are different and they have different needs. And that small group instruction, rather than a whole class um, instruction, is really where the rubber meets the road. So um, we have, again, I talked about the assessments. We have very specific criteria for intervention. We provide additional instruction for students not meeting grade level benchmarks in a three-tiered system. So first it's in the classroom, um, and then it's additional time with a literacy specialist if they move to tier two. Tier three might be um, a more intensive in, um, intervention. So it might be more time, it might be a smaller group, it might be um, a, a more intensive kind of programming. We have very targeted goals for each student and progress monitoring, which means we're checking in very frequently to make sure that they're making the progress that we expect them to make so that we can close the gap. 
And again, early intervention is key because the earlier we do that, the more likely we are to um, ensure that students will be successful readers. We have school-based teams that constantly review progress and adjust plans, and we have a robust plan for communicating with families along the way. So this is our assessment framework. Um, it, I've by no means included everything, but those universal screeners that I talked about, we use something called Ames Web Plus, um, and it has subtests that identify all of those foundational skills. We have formative assessments, which are um, probably our most important assessments, where it, formative assessments are during learning where teachers can respond and adjust. So it's just listening to kids, their response to questions, listening to students talking. It's watching kids as they work. It's conferring with readers and having them read aloud and asking them questions about what they're reading and what they're thinking. Um, it's performance assessments and some on-demand writing, which might mean like um, write a, a quick narrative and, and you know show off all the skills that you know and then student and then teachers can assess that and look at their elaboration and their structure and their conventions. Um, it's notebook responses, particularly in the upper grades. We also um, emphasize student self-assessment. We teach students to use checklists and set goals for themselves and engage in peer conferences because we think it's really important for learners to have agency over their own learning. Um, summative assessments are assessments of learning. Um, I typically think about a math test at the end of a chapter is a good example of a summative assessment or the state test. Did students master the content that was taught and expected? So as I said, we have been studying the science of reading um, for the past few years. Explicit phonics instruction is not new. We have been t using the foundations um, program since 2015, so it's almost 10 years right now. We implemented um, Hegarty phonemic awareness program three or four, I think it was four years ago actually, beginning in kindergarten. So that is not new to us. We have shifted in um, our use of decodable text. We now have a blend of leveled and decodable text. We are, are using decodable texts primarily in kindergarten and first grade for students to practice their phonics. We are very conscious about knowledge building through text sets so that students can really expand their background knowledge. Um, we are prioritizing print strategies, so we're, co we're prompting, when, we, when teachers prompt students when they read with them, they're prompting for decoding and blending to make sure that they're using those skills. We have a process for high-frequency word instruction that is um, in through that orthographic mapping approach, and um, it, it's a, a process that was really research-based but developed by our in-house literacy specialists and um, our teachers are using it and it's very successful. We um, have shifted from thinking about reading levels to the application of phonics skills, particularly with our young readers. When we think about what's benchmark, we want them to be able to be solid in applying their phonics skills. And we have incorporated new assessments for progress monitoring and aligned our professional learning to the science of reading for all staff. So, students under, uh, so teachers understand the why behind what they're doing. High frequency word instruction, I, I talked about that orthographic mapping at the beginning, but it's actually when your brain maps the sounds in words to the letters. So it, it's a glue actually that, that Form bond, forms a bond into memory. So for example, if I said the word s, e, d, that a, i makes that s sound. So we teach students with a, a process that they can practice where they're identifying the sounds and we're pointing out the, what we call the heart sounds or the tricky sounds, that a, i that makes that s sound. And we show, we point out to children the spelling and they actually write it, so they have re repetition, and they practice, and they say it, um, and read it. And this is a sheet that we use to send at home, so um, you'll probably be seeing this for practice. 
So what are students reading in school and at home? And this varies a little bit by approach, so I'm gonna talk about our current approach and then I will share what they're reading in the pilot. So our children, as I said, particularly in kindergarten and first grade, you'll see decodable text. Um, this is one of the series that we use. It's not the only series. We have actually been very fortunate um, that the district has supported our need for libraries with decodable text, um, but these are, we, Jump Rope Readers is the name of this series, and they're very highly engaging. They're chapter books, they're series books, so students feel like our, our little kindergartners and first graders feel like they're reading chapter books. They have engaging chapter uh, characters and stories that run through the series. There's six books in each series. They are fiction and nonfiction, and the nonfiction have are connected to the characters and stories. They sometimes learn things about a library, and so the kids really, really love them. They're highly engaging, and they provide the phonics practice that is so important. They're also well-written, and that's something that's just happened in the publishing world with um, you know, all of the attention to the science of reading, that more and more publishers are putting out high-quality uh, decodable text, not, you know, the fat cat sat and things that didn't make sense. So we're really happy about these. And they build vocabulary, all the things. This is just a peek into what they look like and um, teachers unpack them with students. It's all in the, the front cover of the texts. Hopefully, if your children are reading them, you will see these coming home and practicing at home. So this is just one sample, Tam and the Nats. Um, and I'm not, this is just part of the book, but, um, but you can see that they're really focusing on that short A sound, and it's repeated over and over, but in a way that makes sense to kids. So level texts are something that um, a few years ago, that was like the, the main part of our libraries. Um, they were leveled according to a, a leveling system that really looked at, um, not, on, not only the words, but more the concepts and the features of like flashbacks or continuous text, number of sentences on the page. So they're pattern books. They relied a lot on the pictures. They do build comprehension and vocabulary or language and syntax, like how sentences go, how stories go. So we're not completely getting rid of them because they are important. and and. You know, kids read things in the world. Um, they are also excellent for knowledge building. However, it's, that's one part of our library. So again, there's now more of a balance. So this is an example of, this would be a level A book. It would be like the, the you know, obviously level A is the lowest level. On the way to school, we know that our kindergartners can't read those words. Um, I see the sign. That's a very hard word, that word sign. And it, you can't decode it. Um, so they have to look at the picture to figure that out. And that is what we don't want them to do when they're building their reading skills. So again, great for oral language, great for knowledge building, not great for beginning found, for developing those foundational skills. So what is in the book baggies of our children in grades K through two? There is a blend of leveled and decodable text more decodable. Um, they might also bring home songs and poems. They might bring home alphabet and other charts that are used in the classroom. They might bring home books that are made in school, high frequency word lists, books from the school library. Um, so some of those things are, are um, things that kids can read on their own and some of them are things that parents should read to them. And I would say, no matter how old your children are, continue to read to them at home. It is one of the most important things that you can do for reading, for vocabulary, for like just building that love of reading and modeling it and just time with your children. <laughs> it's um, the best. So now I'm shifting to the interreading pilot. So um, I'm gonna talk about the materials and resources, the professional learning that we provided to our, our teachers who are participating in the pilot, the communication and the feedback. So again, we chose this program because of the core programs 
that were on the state's list. This one mo most closely aligned with our core beliefs and there were components of it that our committee felt strongly we really liked. So our teachers um, received two teacher's manuals. There's a teacher's guide and there's a structured literacy teacher's guide. That's those foundational skills that is in um, kindergarten and, uh, I'm sorry, first and second grade. In third grade, it's all in one book. The student each have their own anthology. So that is one of our shifts. The students are reading that anthology. They're all reading the same book together. So that does foster discourse in the classroom. Um, and um, everybody is, is you know, has a common experience. There's also what we call a start right reader. So it's, a, it's another um, anthology with decodable text for small groups. So that's, that's a um, more differentiated. There's a journal where students uh, have an opportunity to read and respond. And then there is um, a know it, show it, which is more of a workbook for independent practice of skills. Our professional learning began in August. We had somebody from, it's a Houghton Mifflin product, and, and one of the staff developers came and um, provided just an overview of the program because it, it, is, it is a shift. It is what we call a basal program, so it's everything in one place, um, and the methods are just embedded in the program. It, it's, it's a teacher-directed approach. That is a structured literacy approach. So it's more about finding the components and making choices about that than actually um, the different methods. Uh, we've also had virtual grade-level specific sessions. We have building-based professional learning communities where a grade-level team meets every six days and has some additional time in their, built in their schedule to co-plan, to talk about how things are going, how kids are doing, what challenges um, teachers are finding and how they can work together to solve them. So that happens for all of our teachers, but for the pilot teachers, their focus has been um, on the inter-reading implementation. We've had cross-district sessions for the pilot teachers so that they could talk to their colleagues at other schools. We have three first grades. We have um, Royal, Hinley, and Tokenique first grade are all piloting. In second grade, we have Holmes and Ox Ridge. And in third grade, we have Royal and Holmes are piloting. So those teachers have opportunities to talk. Um, we're planning another professional learning session uh, at our next professional learning day on November 5th. We have office hours with our staff developer. There are classroom visits. Um, our administrative team gets into classrooms to see how things are going, as do our literacy um, specialists, and just help support the teams. And many of our teams have had extra release time for collaborative planning. So it's a, f it's a very robust professional learning plan. We have sent letters to families um, of students in the pilot classroom to just you know, let them know that this is a, a pilot program and just ensure them that students are getting high quality instruction in all of the components of reading that they were getting before. We talked about it at open house. Um, teachers will have inf data to share on students during um, their conferences next week, at just as they would you know, with any other program. And then, of course, this parent session, because we wanted to offer more of an opportunity for parents to learn about why and what it looks like and just, you know, reassure everybody that regardless of the materials, we believe that a good teacher is at the heart of teaching kids how to read, regardless of the program. Um, so we do have a mechanism for feedback. We have a live Google document with our Houghton Mifflin representatives, so anytime teachers have questions, they can get feedback and support. We have developed um, our own forms to gather feedback from our teachers because this is a huge decision. Um, it's a huge instructional shift, and every you know we want to make sure that we're doing the best for our students. That's the bottom line. So. Teacher ease, yes, that's, that's important, but the bottom line is, are our students growing and thriving as readers? 
We have literacy team meetings where we have um, our literacy specialists and administrators who are liaisons with the teachers and they bring it back to the team and we gather feedback. And again, I talked about our professional learning communities where teachers share ideas and feedback. So um, our scope and sequence, just to see a comparison, and again, the interreading is, is a, a, a basal program which has everything as opposed to our program where, where we pick and choose resources. And these are just some of the resources. Um, I haven't talked about um, some other, like we just tap into who is the guru for fluency, who is the guru for small group instruction, and we have those resources for our teachers. Um, so, because we really don't believe that any one program is gonna meet the needs of every single child. So I will share this presentation, it's going to be on our website and there are links to grade level specific comparisons, but just to show you what it looks like, this is a sample of third grade and you'll see um, our current compendium of resources and then the inter-reading curriculum and so you can see where the focus is um, on the reading unit and the writing unit and then the foundational skills and how they're developed through each. So um, it's hard to tell specifically when you see a unit that says building a reading life or what is a character, what actually are students learning in that unit. So that's where um, t those teacher newsletters and, and conversations with your classroom teacher and looking at our website where there is more information will be helpful, but I think it's important to see the comparison of the foundational skills. So those are all linked to the presentation. Um, the, bo the bottom line is all students need explicit instruction in phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, reading behaviors, and comprehension. No, nobody will argue with that at all. We believe that reading is complex and requires a mix of instructional methods and materials. We believe that motivation stems from being part of a literacy-rich environment with texts that students can and want to read and peers that talk, who, who talk about books. Reading is social and we believe that that's really important, that motivation to read is what's gonna foster lifelong readers. And we believe in student choice and ownership in their learning. That, that to us is critical. We know, even as adults, everybody in this room does not want to read the same books and wouldn't be interested in the same books. So we don't believe in doing that to children. Fostering a love of reading is, an, is essential. It's, it's a foundational skill for everything our children will be doing in college and career readiness and life. So the next steps for us, we are continuing our implementation of this interreading pilot. We have committed to an implementation through December and I, what we are hearing a little bit is that we may need some more time to make a decision. We're certainly not gonna have enough data for four months. Um, However, that, that is, um, you know, we're looking to get as much as possible. We have also implemented some new resources as part of our compendium of resources. Vocabulary and grammar were two areas that we identified as gaps. We have implemented um, a vocabulary program, it's called Word Love, and our goal is to get kids to fall in love with words and really develop a, a word consciousness. And um, so any teacher, who is not part of the pilot is, is implementing that and we're gathering feedback on that. Um, and in both programs, I would say the feedback that we've heard about vocabulary is that it's, th that is definitely going well regardless of the approach and it's a need and um, people are very happy about that. We are piloting also some updated writing resources that have grammar and spelling um, embedded in them, so that is something that, that some of our teachers are also, I, I wouldn't say piloting because it's our same program, it's just an enhanced version, but we're getting feedback on the um, effectiveness of that and looking at student achievement when we, when we make those decisions. 
we're gathering teacher feedback, we are looking at data, we are looking at classroom observations and what the instruction looks like, what the level of engagement looks like in our students, um, what the conversation sounds like, and we're planning for next year's budget. We're planning for multiple options um, at this point because, as I said, you know, we're, we're really not sure. We are really going into this with an open mind and thinking about what is the best for our learners in our classrooms in Darien. So with that, I thank you for joining us today. And um, I know some of you are taking pictures. This will be posted on our website and I'll ask the principals as well to just share it out with everybody. It is being recorded for anybody that wasn't here. So I thank you for joining us, and if anybody has any questions that I can answer or some of our team can answer, we're happy to do so.